Hello, peoples, 14 of yous. Are we recording? Are we recording? We are recording, good, okay. So if any of you were in cell biology yesterday, I really struggled. My computer's kind of on the fritz over there. I'm using my wife's, I think I got all the problems worked out, so we should be fine today. Fingers crossed. Let's wait a couple of minutes. People may show. We have barely half the class today, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see Victoria's iPhone is here. Is Victoria here? Yeah, I'm here. You're here too? Oh, good. Good. I know sometimes my phone runs off and it gets into Zooms and damn phone. Um, let's see your faces, people. Let's be a class momentarily. Elijah, I love that hair. You know Willie Corley? He looks kind of like that now too. His hair is a little bit longer than mine though. Oh, okay. Sam Robinson, most people don't know us, but he's totally bald on top. That's why he always wears a hat. <laughs> he's a pro fisherman, isn't he? No, you're a hunter, aren't you? Duck hunter. That's what we talked about. Okay, okay, Victoria. Victoria, Esha, whose name can I make fun of next? I can't see anything. Michelle Simmons, that's that's a pretty boring name. I can't even make a joke out of that. All right, well, why don't we just go ahead? Um, I'm gonna share my PowerPoint with you all. Where's my PowerPoint? So finding this chapter a little frustrating, I um, taught this class last year for the first time. So this is my second time through this. And um, I'm still kind of getting a grasp of what's going on in this chapter. It seems like at the beginning, they tell you all the answers. And then around the middle, it shifts to explaining how they found those answers. So most of what is going on now is like the experiments that they did to find, find out the things that, that they told us earlier. I find that a little frustrating. I would rather it was just, it went the other way. Like first show you how they found stuff and you like learning what they found as they're going along. I may reorganize this the next time I teach it, but for now we're going with the order of the chapter. So anyway, in the last class, in the last class we talked about um, different factors that are endorsing mesoderm and these animal cap factors that are stopping the mesoderm from, from spreading up into the ectoderm. Um, and then, so I got it. Oh, here, this is what I wanted to get to. So talking about taking pieces of the embryo and, and culturing them as an explant or transplanting them into somewhere, somewhere else and figuring out things like this, where the positional information that's important and, um, before that, we were looking at how um, different tissues can cause induction of, of, of um, different structures in these animal caps. So all we know at this point, theoretically, I mean, this is probably mid 20th century. Um, all they really know is that endoderm is causing mesoderm to be produced. They don't know how or why, because the molecular tools are just not there yet. So now we're getting, the research we're going to be talking about more kind of like 1980s, 1990s era research, and which is basically identifying what hormones are being released and what they're what they're um, what they're turning on and why is that causing these specifications that we see. Now, in order to prove this, a lot of um, a lot of uh, factors have to be accounted for. You have to show that. The hormone you're talking about is there at the time when you expect it to be there. Um, 
and it's there in the right concentration. As we'll see today, concentration is really, really important. You can get different effects with different concentrations of, of the same hormone. Um, and also that the cells that are supposed to be responding to the hormone are in the right place and they have receptors for that hormone as well. So um, this is how you go about pr uh, proving that. Okay, so one of the things they use a lot, and actually I did some of these experiments back in the day, um, is a dominant negative receptor. So dominant negative means when you inject this, is going to knock out all signal transduction through that particular receptor. So in this case, they're using the activin receptor. So activin is a TGF beta-like receptor or TGF beta-like hormone. It's got both a type one and a type two receptor. Um, the type one is the one that usually binds in these TGF beta things are usually the one that actually binds the hormone. The type two then binds to the type one. So a thing about the active and type two receptor is that it, it, it will bind to several different TGF beta receptors. So it's got one in type two, but this type two will also bind to like, you know, uh, XNR type one receptor or BMP type one receptor. So it can knock out by, so this particular receptor can knock out all TGF beta like um, inductions in the, in the, um, in the embryo. So this is what a dominant negative is, like physically how it's made. Here's your normal receptor, which has got hormone binding on the outside, transmembrane region, and then a kinase domain. And all you gotta do is cut that kinase domain off. And now you've got something that will bind hormone, but won't transduce a signal. And the nice thing about this too is it will knock out all, and if, if you overexpress it, so there's more of this truncated receptor than there is of the endogenous receptor being expressed in the cells already, you can totally knock out all um, signal, signal transduction in cell through the, that would be caused by those hormones. So basically what we're doing here, this is normal. You've got the hormone activating receptors producing signal. You inject this truncated receptor and now you knock out all TGF beta like um, signal transduction. So the way we actually do this is you get some, some eggs, you fertilize them. When they hit the two cell stage, you inject messenger RNA in both cells of the two cell stage for this truncated um, TGF beta receptor. And when you do, you find here's normal you put in a little bit, you start ventralizing, so there's less dorsal structures, and you go to high concentration, and now you, you don't have any dorsal structures at all. So you can see that um, TGF beta-like things are going to be important for setting up the dorsal side of the embryo. Otherwise, you have just ventral tissue. <coughs> and again, we already talked about you know, what the, what the TGF beta like hormones are, but this is how they came about realizing that they were important. Okay, and this is what they actually are. Actually, we're gonna add a few here that we didn't talk about before. Um, first, we talk, we've talked about the XNRs, Xenopus nodal related. So in the book, they tend to call them nodals sometimes, and sometimes they call them XNRs. Um, I'm gonna keep calling them XNRs, but just know XNR means nodal. That's what the middle N means. And then when we get into mouse, it will be called nodal. So, you know, keep that in mind. And it's going to do the same thing in mouse as it does here. Another one called derriere. Again, scientists have good senses of humor or bad senses of humor anyway. Derriere. Um, another hormone. Uh, it's also called growth differentiation factor three. I think VG1 is called growth differentiation factor one, but uh, don't worry about that. So anyway, GDF3 or derriere um, will activate some uh, or potentiate the activation of some TGF beta-like signaling and it will block others. So it's kind of a, a complicated hormone. Um, BMPs, BMP3, I think, or four is the one that we're most interested in. They're gonna be really important because they induce mesoderm, but ventral mesoderm. Your, nod your nodals will be more um, 
uh, dorsal and BMPs more ventral mesoderm. Uh, so VG1 is another one and Activin, not really sure what the role of Activin is, but it's it has shown to be there. Sometimes there's like redundancy in that there's Activin there, you know it's there, you know the receptors are there, it's signaling happens, you knock it out, there's no change, you know? So that happens a lot too, where um, there's just redundancy in some of the hormonal things going on. Okay, so these are all TGF beta like hormones, <clears throat> and they're important for mesoderm induction and for dorsal ventral patterning. And here we are your veg T, remember, is that endodermal um, transcription factor makes all of this endoderm. And part of being endoderm is releasing your nodules. So you get a release of nodules that then causes mesoderm induction around the middle. And if you notice, there's like a gradient of nodules. There's a small amount of it here and a high amount of it here. And that's because of the effect of beta catenin on veg T. So these are both transcription factors. Um, and when they are both together in the same cells, you get an even greater release of XNRs than you do with just the veg T alone. Here's something else to keep in mind kind of in the back of your mind. I keep saying this is a hormone, this is a transcription factor. That's really important. You know, I, I just kind of say it, but it is really important because um, a hormone is gonna be released from a cell and diffuse away. So it can go a distance away from the cell it was made. A transcription factor is always going to stay in the cell that it's in. So that's really the big difference between these two and why I keep pointing them out. Just checking my notes to make sure I told you everything I meant to. Okay. Okay. So one thing, so I didn't talk about, I don't have a slide on this. So I'm going to show you my notes. Um, um. Okay. So do, do, do. this was the, the active in uh, dominant negative stuff. Okay, so da, 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 da. so other techniques to show that um, show which hormones are are coming on or not. Newer techniques, the molecular ones, are like immunohistochemistry. Um, so you can make an antibody specific to a phosphorylated SMAD. So you know, obviously, you can make a uh, an antibody against just a SMAD, right? Because any protein you can make an antibody against it but you can actually differentiate between a, a phosphorylated and unphosphorylated SMAD. So that's really important because with that um, uh, antibody against the phosphorylated SMAD, you can see not only is the SMAD there, but is it has it been activated? And what they see is like, and you can tell the difference between different signaling patterns by which SMADs are turned on. If you remember, we talked about when we talked about TGF beta like things, I said um, BMPs activate SMAD 1, 5, and 8, and XNRs activate SMADs 2 and 3. So by looking to see which SMADs are active, you can see which hormones are, are, are present, right? Or which hormones are, are around and active in receptors. Okay, so again, that's just my point there being that's just another way they another mechanism they use to, or another technique they use to figure out these hormonal um, expressions and effects. Okay, so getting back to veg T, our good old friend, good old friend veg T. Okay, so veg T, actually we're talking about brachiary right now, hang on one second. So veg T back here, causes the expression of these nodules, XNRs1, 4, 4, um, and that makes this into mesoderm. So what does that actually mean? That means that it's going to cause the production of the transcription factor, brachiuri. So this is a new one <clears throat> that you need to memorize. So brachiuri then is a transcription factor, and it will um, allow mesodermal genes to be turned on. Remember, um, I, I, I know I keep saying this, but um, you know, there's a difference between being faded and being turned on. 
So once once you add those XNRs, those those tissues are fated to become a mesoderm, and they're fated that way because now you've got brachyuria being expressed there. So <clears throat> you can see here this this is you know this is a cross section through the middle. So you can ma imagine a ring of brachyuria expression around that blastula. And the neat thing about this ring, if you notice how distinct it is between what's, what's turned on and what's turned off, right? And why would that be? Since these um, uh, XNRs are diffusible factors that you should get a gradient of, of being turned on, but you don't. And the reason is because you've got these threshold effects and the threshold is in this case is caused by FGF. So FGF is fibrobla fibroblast growth factor. We'll talk about its mechanism of, of uh, its uh, signal transduction mechanism later, probably in the next class. But it's very different from TGF beta like signaling. Okay? Um, similar, but very different and a lot complicated, a lot more complicated. But anyway, when XNRs turn on brachyuria, brachyuria comes up and causes the production of FGF, and FGF causes the production of brachyuria. So these two are sustaining each other in this positive feedback loop. And so that keeps brachyuria expressed in the mesodermal cells. Okay, that's your positive feedback loop keeping brachyuria expressed. Okay. Now, concentration effects. This is really important. This, there's a lot of patterning happens because of concentration gradients. So what we see here, and we've talked about a little bit, VEGT and beta-catenin together introduce the, the transcription factor CMWA. I don't know how to pronounce that word. I'm just calling it CMWA. We'll see. Um, but anyway, that gets expressed in this dorsal part, because that's where your, your cortical rotation put the uh, beta-catenin um, uh, uh, beta catenin increasing factors over here, dorsalizing factors. So you get CMWA being produced over here, and CMWA then causes that it's the new coop center now because CMWA is there, and that causes a great increase in XNR release. So you've got a normal XNR throughout the rest of the embryo, but here, because of that beta catenins and CMWA, you get a ton of XNR release. And that excess XNR then, along with everything else that's there, causes another transcription factor to come up here called guscoid. Uh, <clears throat> guscoid is then going to cause this mesodermal tissue to become the uh, Spiemann organizer, okay? So guscoid then is specific to Spiemann. When that comes up, you've got your Spiemann organizer. Um, and as we've seen before, that's what's going to give us our dorsal ventral axis or, and our anterior posterior axis, because this is where that elastopore lip is, where, this, where the tissues will go through. Okay, so guscoid then is our next, our next uh, new transcription factor. So VEGT and beta-catenin together in this area over here causes the production of CMWA. And CMWA then increases the XNRs, which, tur which turns on guscoid over here. Now that's the Spiemann organizer. In the next class, we'll see how that turns on these other factors that'll be released and diffuse in the opposite direction in this way and help setting up that, um, that uh, uh, gradient and setting up the axis. Okay, I'm running out of things to talk about here. I, you know what? I should have a quiz for you guys today. That would that would be a good thing. I think you're you're about ready for a quiz. Should have put one together. Let's see if I can dig one up before you guys leave. Okay, so speaking of concentration, how do we know concentrations are important? There's an experiment here. Oh, I'm sorry. This is kind of summing up what we just said. You've got XNRs being released and BMP4 here, which turns this whole thing into ventral mesoderm, but you've got your dorsalizing factors here and causing increase in beta-catenin and that in VEGT 
increases XNRs, produces goosecoid, and this is going to make this dorsal. And then you'll get a dorsal ventral axis because of that. OK, concentration. So here's an example of this is kind of this is an in vitro experiment, and it's not necessarily telling us what's going on in the embryo, but it's showing us the effect of concentration gradients in in the uh, in the uh, in development. So what this experiment is is basically you take a whole bunch of um, blast of blastulas, right? A whole bunch of embryos at the blastula stage. You take all their animal caps off and you treat different groups of them with different concentrations of activin. So you have basically a, a dose response of activin in these, um, in these cells. So what you see is that very low activin, these animal cap cells are just expressing keratin, their epidermis. So without getting any activin at all, they're going to stay epidermal ectoderm, okay? When you give them kind of a medium amount of activin, or as activin increases, you start seeing production of brachiuri. And brachiuri is kind of like a, a middle mesodermal um, marker. It's pretty much expressed all through the mesoderm, but uh, not particularly dorsal. And then as you go to higher concentration of activin, suddenly you start turning on goosecoid in these animal caps. And so that's showing you then that Again, you increase the concentration, it's turning on different genes and making different tissues that way. And here is the same thing done a different way. So basically here they've taken um, some beads and coated them with activin and then set them on top of an animal cap. So this is your animal cap here. They take this bead with a low amount of activin in it and they set it down. And so now you've got a point source. You, the activin is activin is starts here and it diffuses away. And you know, like any diffusion, it gets less concentrated as you get further away from the source. So here, with a low amount of activin, you get a brachiuri expression all around those beads. You do the same thing with a high concentration of activin, and now you've got a concentration gradient of activin. And where it's highest, you're getting goosecoid, and where it's middle, you're getting um, brachiuri. And when there really isn't any, you're getting nothing, just, just epidermal, um, uh, epidermal uh, um, ectoderm. Man, these words all sound the same. Is anyone seeing the PowerPoint? Oh, I'm not showing my PowerPoint? Jesus, Jesus. I'm not seeing it. <laughs> Damn it. I've been like, oh, look at this, look at this. Let me back up a little bit and look at this again. Who, who asked about that chat? Chat, 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 chat. Tyler. Tyler gets a bonus point for, for keeping my head in the game. I'm lying about the bonus point, but please keep my head in the game. Okay, backing up about 10 minutes and looking at the figures while discussing them. So here we can talk about our um, concentration effects of these TGF beta-like factors. XNRs 1, 2, and 4 are making mesoderm, mostly ventral. And then over here where you've got your beta catenin as well as VEGT, that turns on CMOA, which then causes a big increase in these three XNRs, and that causes goosecoid to be formed here. So concentration-dependent effects. Um, remember, this is the same same hormone, XNR here, XNR there. Here you're getting one thing, here you're getting something else. It's about the concentration. And then this is that active in experiment. <clears throat> so these are animal caps in vitro and very low active in. You're getting epidermis. So basically no induction of anything. It just stays epidermis. Uh, medium, you're getting brachiuri, which is a muscle, muscle actin, a middle, middle mesoderm. And high concentration of activin, you're getting goosecoid coming up, which is your organizer. And here are the beads. <clears throat> so here's your animal cap. And this is a bead with a small amount of activin and the diffusion away from it. So in the local area near the bead where there's some activin, you're getting um, uh, brachiuri. 
And, and then when you use a high concentration of activin, now you've got a gradient from here to here of activin. So where it's highest, you're getting your dorsal goosecoid being expressed. As it decreases, you're getting brachiary. And as it peters out, you're getting just epidermis. And you get, again, you've got kind of distinct layers here, right? You're seeing sharp bands between one and the other. And that's because of this kind of activity over here. If you've got low activin, um, you'll get brachiary, and brachiary inhibits the expression of goosecoid. Now, as you increase activin, you start to force goosecoid expression, and goosecoid represses brachiary. So, because of those interactions between the goosecoid and brachiary, you're getting really distinct layers of, of separation between the, the different tissues. But again, you know, this is key. We'll talk about in the next class about the production of the dorsal ventral axis. And this concentration thing is really important because that's what's going to set up your axis, um, different concentrations of XNR expression. Okay, so here's a summary of where we are. <clears throat> Veg T is always in the vegetal region. <clears throat> And it's going, it's a general inducing signal to produce nodals, the nodal related XNRs. And they will produce mesoderm. At the dorsal side, you've got um, those, the cortical rotation dor dorsalizing factors there. So you get Spiemann organizer over there. And then in the next thing, we're going to talk about how you've got ventralizing signals of BNP4 and XWINT8 and dorsalizing signals of cordon and noggin. You'll see how these two different things kind of interact with each other and form a gradient pattern across that, that axis. Oh my God, it's only 1.30. All right, you're definitely getting a quiz today. Oh, shoot. Chat. What's beta catenin? Oh, okay. So we talked about this, oh God, probably Monday. So let me bring it up for you. Yeah, this is it. You remember this? So this is the, the wind pathway is producing beta catenin. So normally beta catenin is being broken down, but when wind is around, now beta catenin doesn't get broken down and it starts to do signal transduction. So it's a transcription factor and it's really important. Um, in this case, it's important for producing the dorsal, um, the dorsal uh, dorsalness. So you've got beta catenin built up over here, and that's what makes it the organizer. Um, we'll talk about a different patterning with wince later as well. Okay. All right, all right, all right. Mm. Dig up, uh, dig up a quiz for y'all, as we say in southern. Don't move, don't move, don't move. Don't you move, okay. What's this look like? Ooh, 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 this looks like a quiz a lot of people will fail. Let's do this quiz. So XNR will induce, let me back up. Can I go over SMADS again, beta catenin? XNR will induce the organizer goosecoid. Does WINT11 help produce beta catenin? Okay, yes. And the answer to all those things is yes. All right. <laughs> Hang on. I'll, uh, what am I sharing now anyway? I don't even know what I'm sharing. I'll go over each of those questions now. Smads. What's the matter with you? <laughs> Not funny. 
Okay. So whence are these things? So whence you're allowed, you'll always associate with beta catenin. SMADs are always with TGF beta like signaling. Where's that? There we go. Here it is. So uh, your TGF beta likes, your BMP4, your XNR will interact with first a what I call receptor SMAD. They may call it something different in the in the book, but the, the SMAD that oops. The SMAD that directly interacts with the receptor, which is here. And that gets phosphorylated by the by the receptor, and then that receptor SMAD will then bind to a cyto cytoplasmic SMAD, which is usually SMAD four. So SMAD four goes across both different types, and then that goes in and becomes a transcription factor. <clears throat> so the important thing to keep in mind with these SMADs is for BNP four, you've got SMADs one, five, and eight. For XNRs, you've got SMADs two and three. Okay. So basically there's signal transduction proteins that get phosphorylated by the receptor and the, the production you get in the end depend, or the result you get in the end depends on which SMADs get activated. See down here, you're getting ventral mesoderm with SMADs one, five and eight, and then dorsal mesoderm with, uh, with SMADs two and three. So XNR will induce the organizer goosecoid. Correct, that's from Esha. So, Yes and no. I mean, yes, if it's at a really high concentration. At a medium or low concentration, it will not. So that's the key thing to remember about, about XNRs. Does WINT11 help produce beta catenin? Yes, it does, because beta cat, uh, WINT11 will activate this signaling pathway with frizzled. Okay. A lot of different WINTs, WINT11, WINT9, Win three. I imagine if there's a Wint 11, there must be a one through 10 as well. Um, okay. BMP4 and XNR are a type of growth factor. That's correct. These are diffusible because they're growth factors. They're hormones. Okay. You ready for a quiz? Let's do a new share. Sharon is Karen. Okay. Can you all see this? Let's uh, let's do some uh, calling out of people to make them uncomfortable. First question: Maternally placed transcription factor that specifies endoderm. This is pretty easy. Maraid Lawless. I'm just going by the order of people in my role here. Maraid Lawless. That was, we were just talking about it, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it's the veg tea or? Correct. Okay. <laughs> okay. Number two, Elijah Crossborn. Locks wind signaling by binding to, L, binding to LRP56. Honestly, I don't remember myself. <clears throat> oh, that's terrible. Terrible, but true. Okay, let's back up. Go to our... Yeah, I, I have no idea. I was counting on you, Elijah, because I don't know. You let me down. Dickoff, there it is. Dickoff binds to LRP56 and inhibits activation of frizzled by Wnt. Oh, Stefan, Stefan, um, I'll, I'll say the question again when I go back to it. 
is the organizer located in the same area as the new coop center so sort of um it's above the new coop center new coop center is vegetal and it's below so new coop, and the uh Spiemann organizer is mesoderm and it's dorsal above okay okay so can you explain dick off again okay so basically we talked about this pathway. Let's see if I can change my share. New share. Okay, so this is your winch pathway. So Dickoff will bind to this orange one here, here, LRP56. Okay, so it'll bind to this. And then when wind is around, it'll bind to frizzled, but nothing will happen because it doesn't have this factor to help it. Okay. And we haven't seen it used yet. It'll come into play eventually though. So it's kind of keep in the back of your head kind of a thing. Oops. All right, let's go back to our quiz. Okay, blocks wind signaling by binding LRP. That's dick, dickhead, <clears throat> sorry, dick off. A ubiquitin ligase that limits the spread of mesoderm induction. Ooh, that's a question for Stefan. Stefan McCain. <clears throat> ubiquitin ligase that limits the spread of mesoderm induction. Give you a hint, it starts with an E. Silly question. Dickoff outside the cell membrane. Correct. Yes, Dickoff would be extra extracellular. <clears throat> Stefan. What do you got? I can tell you what slide it's on. <clears throat> I actually know the answer to this question, believe it or not. <laughs> it is on slide 25. Slide 25 of the PowerPoint. How about Lauren Bintz? Do you know this one? Lauren Bintz, are you here? B-I-N-T-Z, Bintz, Binch, Bintz. She's ignoring me. She's probably not even there. Are you angry with me, Lauren? Or are you just uh, not talking? Okay, and Audra. Audra Sanange. Ectoderm and Angelique comes through with it. The, no, Stefan, uh, veg, veg one is a hormone, yes. Um, not important here though. Veg T is the transcription factor, which is the answer to the first question up here. Okay, ectoderm is correct for the ubiquitin ligase. Okay, the SMAD that both XNRs and BMPs have in common. Oh, I just said this. We're going with semi rock. nope. Audra Sadange, I don't want to pass you up. I know how upset you get when I do. Audra, are you there? Audra Sadange. She's ignoring me. Sam Robinson. Sorry, is it the MAD4? SMAD4, correct. They both, both uh, different pathways use SMAD4. So, and that's what's important about ectodermin because ectodermin gets rid of SMAD4. So it knocks out both pathways, both the BNP and the XNR pathways. Okay, Sammy, you know you're up next. Transcription factor that is upregulated by VEG1 and beta catenin. Just talked about this one today. Sammy? You're Canadian, aren't you, Sam? Close enough. <laughs> oh, that's right. You're almost in Canada. Because this word is almost French. Uh, I'm not too sure. Samois? Did. Samois? Siamois? Well, we talked about this today where if you've got high, veg one is everywhere in the bottom in the endoderm, but then you've got extra beta catenin because of the cortical rotation, and that produces Samois, which makes those cells the new coop center. When in embryo, when in embryo development, so Audra, 
not mad for, but smad for. We're close. Okay. When in embryo development, that transcription from embryonic nuclei starts. Oh, what do we call that? What, what part of the development does transcription start from the embryonic nuclei? Michelle Simmons? Oh, wait, I skipped Alex. Alex McKeeran. This was uh, Wednesday's lecture. Yeah, I'm not remembering the answer. Okay, Michelle Simmons, any luck there? Blast no, sorry. Stefan, you're wrong, but I love your answer. Blastulation, mid-blastula. So the mid-blastula transition is when transcription starts um, from the from the uh, zygotic embryos or whatever after the twelfth cleavage. Correct. <clears throat> Okay, number seven. Bad news, Akiela Simon. Europe. Number six. No, number seven. <clears throat> Can you finish that whole sentence? Number seven. Um, when in embryo development, that's it's when embryo. Wait, wait. Who? Um, I can't. Who is this? <laughs> Akiela. Oh, okay, okay. Because it says you're muted. Oh, um, my iPad is also logged on. So oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, honestly, uh, I have no idea about this one. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Wait, can you, um, is, is that a Caribbean accent I hear? Yeah, I'm from Antigua. Oh, Antigua. Oh, I've been to Antigua. Gorgeous, gorgeous yes. island. I loved it. The people are so nice there, too. Okay, let's move on. Let's go to Antigua. What the hell are we doing in Plattsburgh? Um, Vanessa Gordon, Vanessa, she's from Antigua too. No, Jamaica, Jamaica, Queens. Oh, Vanessa? <laughs> yes, yes, Jamaica, but, um. Oh, no, I'm Vanessa. <laughs> Vanessa? So come down. Um, Number seven, sperm entry activates. I've said this about 10 times today already. Yeah, I was a, um, Aquila, mm -mm. can't help you there. <laughs> Okay. I'm not really sure. Esha. Esha Gupta. Um, I know the sperm entry if the axes start developing. Not I developing. Think, no. Does it enter at the Ah. Uh, well, Stefan says cortical rotation. Stefan is right, as usual. Thanks, Stefan. As usual. You should, shouldn't say as usual because he's usually wrong, actually. Um, so someone asked what answer to five was. Five is Siamwa. S-I-A-M-O-I-S. -I I'm not sure how to pronounce it. That's just what I say. Okay. Sperm entry activates cortical rotation, which moves the blank. Moves the blank determine the blank side of the dorsal ventral axis. What gets moved during cortical rotation? Evans, Cujo. Evans, Cujo, are you alive? He's alive. Nothing, Evans? Can you unmute and let us know you're still breathing? He can't. I think a lot of people just turn their computer on and walk away. Okay, Anthony Estevez. Anthony. Anthony. The cortis. What's that? Move the cortis. Uh, mm, not really. Sperm entry activates the cortical. Is it egg? Nope, the egg's not moving. This is moving within the egg. So the cortical rotation moves what to determine the I'll give you a hint, dorsal side of the dorsal ventral axis. Are you looking for the dorsalizing factors? Yes, exactly, exactly. Who said that? You just got a, a plus one in my heart anyway. I don't know, whoever said it. Okay, eight, Angelique. Actually, I think Angelique's already answered one. 
She can be off the hook if she wants to be. Okay, blank is a transcription factor that causes the production and release of the growth factor blank. It causes upper regulation of blank, creating a positive feedback loop. Oh, ho, ho. so even I don't know the answer of this until I see that positive feedback loop. We talked about one positive feedback loop here. So let's back up from that spot. Blank causes the upregulation of blank, creating a positive feedback loop. We talked about that today. Uh, can I pass? I actually don't know. <laughs> okay, you can pass. Cool. Let me add a word here. See if it'll help. Oh, that may not be right. Sorry. Never mind. Oh, that's right. Yes. All right. Instead of just telling you the answer, let's go back and look at it again. That's called good teaching. Okay. Positive feedback loop we talked about today, this one. Okay, so <clears throat> brachiuri is a mesodermal transcription factor that causes the production and release of FGF. Let's go back to our question. So brachiuri is a mesodermal transcription factor that causes the production and release of the growth factor FGF. FGF causes the upregulation of brachiuri, creating a positive feedback loop. That's our positive feedback loop. And what do we got next? Fates, fates, fates. All right, we've got two minutes left. And I really hate to not give a, a do Sabor a question because he's my bright shining star in this class. He always knows everything. So let's ask him this question. If you separate the two cells after the initial cleavage of a zygote, each will become a fully formed embryo. If you separate the, the four cells after the next cleavage, none of the resulting cells will become normal embryos. Why is this? Why is this? The returning theme of Usabor, of Dusabor. Unmute yourself. Um, it happened by the four cell stage. I feel like it's simple, but sure. Hmm. What happens right after the sperm enters? Uh, notes. Ask Stefan. Stefan knows. Uh, Stefan? Cortical rotation. Cortical rotation. So why after four cells, don't you get totipotent cells? All right, I, I'm getting the sense you people aren't studying. Hmm, hmm. Four, four cells. Maybe we'll have a quiz on Monday that does count. Okay. So the problem here with number 10 is you've got cortical rotation, which puts dorsalizing factors at one end. So because of that, when you split the embryo, these cells are different from these cells over here. So you don't get complete embryos anymore. Okay, let's just stop sharing now. So I will, I started grading your exams yesterday. I'll finish that today. And then hopefully in about an hour or two. So you get your, your, your results from that, okay? 
that's about all I have for today. And we are running late anyway for the first time. Um, hope to see you all back here on Monday. Have a great weekend, guys. Can I ask a quick question? Oh, sure. So um, part of that cleavage um, for between the first and the second, where you have uh, like pluripotent versus multipotent, um, for that first cleavage, you have to cut along the same plane as where the sperm entered, right? Right, right. And it yeah. does, it does that. Yep. Yeah. Because if you don't, then you get the same problem as before with the dorsaling factors on one side and the ventral on the other, right? Right, right. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? Akila, did you have a question for me by email? I don't know how you're sticking up my mind. All right. I'm going to let you.